You'll see once this video gets going that I don't start from scratch. This is actually a continuation of bifurcations of two-dimensional linear systems and the trace determinant plane part one that was recorded all at once. So you'll see that I, um, again, I don't start from scratch, that um, you need to have recently watched part one to realize where I am in the video. So if you haven't done that recently, make sure you go back and look at that. There's another way that the, that the book focuses on visualizing this, and that is to draw something called the trace determinant plane. Make a new plane with new axes, label the horizontal axis with T, standing for trace, and the vertical axis with D standing for determinant. This is not, um, you know, you don't draw solutions in here. There are no solutions in this plane. This is a parameter plane. We imagine points in here as corresponding to two para to parameter values, in a sense, for certain trace and determinant, based on whatever A is for our problem. For a given value of A, we'll be able to compute the tracing determinant, and that value of A will correspond to a certain point in this plane. Now, I'm not going to go through the details of how to derive the following important curves that tell you where bifurcations occur. That's in the book. I'll let you read it. It really involves thinking a lot about signs of things and relative sizes of things, just like I did a few minutes ago with the example for number three. Thinking about where things are negative, where they're positive, where they're bigger than other things. That kind of thinking gives you three critical loci, three critical curves, if you will. One of them is called the repeated root parabola. It looks like that, and it's got the equation d equals 1 fourth t squared, or equivalently, t squared equals 4d. If when you uh, figure out how the trace and determinant depend on a, and if you graph a parametric curve in this plane as a varies, whenever it crosses the, this repeated root parabola, a bifurcation will occur. When it crosses that, the instant it crosses, for that value of a, you've got a square root of zero underneath for, from the quadratic formula. You'll get two, one repeated real root for your characteristic polynomial, one repeated eigenvalue, and that's a case where a bifurcation will occur. Another critical locus loci is the plural of locus, is the positive d-axis, including the origin, and so the uh, parabola includes the origin too. It's got equation t equals zero, but it also satisfies the inequality that d is bigger than or equal to zero. I suppose you could just consider the parabola to include the origin and this one not to if you wanted to just say d is bigger than zero. If your parametric curve showing how t and d vary as your parameter a varies crosses this positive d, d axis as the parameter varies, a bifurcation will occur. And what happens when you're on that positive d axis is you have purely imaginary eigenvalues. The um, real part of those eigenvalues will be zero. Though that corresponds for linear systems to centers. When you've got a center, the equilibrium point at the origin being a center, that's the case with purely imaginary eigenvalues. And we've seen examples like that, like undamped harmonic oscillators, undamped. One more critical locus is the t-axis, the entire t-axis. It's got equation d equals zero. When the determinant is zero, 
As the parameter a varies, if it passes over that line, d equals zero, that's the case where you get lots of different things possibly happening. Um, it turns out that points down here correspond to saddles at the origin. If your parametric curve described as the parameter changes crosses over here, the saddle bifurcates changes to become a, um, a source. If the par parametric curve crosses over here, it bifurcates to become a sink. These are a real source and a real sink. And if it crossed through the origin and maybe over into this region first or that region first, as it crossed through the origin, a bifurcation would occur from a saddle to a spiral sink over here or a spiral source if it went over here. And again, along the positive d-axis, that's where you have a center along the positive d-axis. So this picture encapsulates what happens for linear systems. Along the critical loci, it's the situation where it's the material from section 3.5. You either have repeated eigenvalues or zero as an eigenvalue. Zero will be an eigenvalue when the determinant is zero, the determinant of A. Strange things can happen in those cases. Also where you have a, uh, well not so strange when the real part is zero, that's going to be a center, but strange things can happen along the repeated root parabola and along the t-axis. It's the topic of section 3.5, which you should read about. So how does this apply? How do we use this trace determinant plane? Well, coming back to the example I just showed you, in that example I just showed you, the trace was 2a, and the determinant was uh, negative a. If I think of that as describing a parametric curve, described by this parametric equation as a, the parameter varies, it's going to describe a certain curve in this trace determinant plane. What curve will it will describe? You could just plot some points. You could make a chart and keep track of how t and d vary as you make that chart. You could use your calculator, para parametric mode in your calculator, or you could use Mathematica to make, with parametric plot, to make that parametric curve. Um, I'll plot a couple points. It's actually going to be a straight line because these are linear. So I'll just plot a couple points and connect the dots. When a is 0, t is 0, and d is 0. So it goes through the origin. When a is 1, t is 2, and, a, and d is negative 1. So the point t equals 2, d equals negative 1 is on this parametric curve. Is that point above or below this parabola? You've got to think about it a bit. Um, if you plug t equals 2 into this equation, you get 2 squared times 1 fourth is 4 over 4 over 1. d is 1. OK, I'm making mistakes here. It's not going to be up there, excuse me. When t is 2, d equals negative 1. I guess I should plot a third point when a is negative 1. Um, t is going to be negative 2 and d will be positive 1. Is that on um, or above or below this parabola? If you plug in t equals negative 2 into this equation, you get d is positive 1. In fact, this particular point right there is exactly on the parabola. If we plug in some other value of a, like a equals negative 2, to get t is negative 4 and a is positive 2, we could see that that's below the parabola. Because if I plug in t equals negative 4 into this equation, I get uh, 16 over 4, I get positive 4 for d. In other words, the point negative 4, positive 4 is on this parabola, which means this point that I'm at, negative 4, positive 2, is below the parabola. 
I'll let you uh, spend a minute or two thinking about all that I said there. I know it went by kind of fast. But after you come back, what I'm drawing here is the parametric curve described by this equation here that shows how the system changes as A varies. And when A is a negative number, you're over here. And as A increases, it moves to the right. You might want to put arrows on this line showing that the direction of motion of this parametric curve is to the right as A increases. So you can see very nicely that you start out as a sink, a real sink. Does that correspond to what we said before? Yes, it does. Two negative distinct real eigenvalues. Here, when, which is where you are when A is negative 1, you've got um, one repeated real eigenvalue. When you're in here, you've got uh, two complex eigenvalues with negative real part. When you're right there, A is 0. And you end up with, um, I guess I didn't say what that was before. When A is 0, oh yeah, I did. You have 0 as a repeated eigenvalue. 0 is an eigenvalue. And it does happen to be repeated. Um, a bifurcation occurs there, too. It's going to be a strange kind of system. And then when A is bigger than 0, you're over here. You're a, a saddle point at the origin. You can do all this with two parameter problems, too. I don't have enough time on this video to do that. I'm not sure if I'm going to make another video like that. Um, essentially, let me just give you a little quick indication of where that occurs. In number 8, for example, you've got a system where your coefficient matrix involves two parameters. And essentially, to approach a problem like that, what you can do is get the trace and determinant of both, in terms of both A and B. In this case, the uh, trace would be A plus 1, and the determinant would be A minus B. And essentially, you can create a, an AB plane, an AB parameter plane, where you draw in critical loci showing you where bifurcations occur in that AB plane. In both of those kinds of planes, like this one up here and that AB plane that I'm referring to, again, realize that like when I draw that parametric curve, that's not a solution curve. All it's illustrating is just how the trace and determinant vary as the parameter increases. And it allows you to visually see where bifurcations are. Um, a nice, real quickly, a nice program you can use on the CD-ROM to visualize this. One nice thing is actually uh, TD animation. You can see the linear system here, how it changes as the parameter increases. This is the matrix A over here. We can run the movie down here and we can watch the phase portrait change. And up here we see the trace determinant plane. And this rectangle, if you want to zoom in on that, will show how the trace and determinant are changing as the, um, the matrix changes. They change along a rectangle. And here I'm going to run the movie now. So we try to watch everything at once. Ready? One, two, three, go. You can run it ahead one step at a time. You can see it changing from essentially a spiral sink to a center to a spiral source to a real source to a saddle point back to a uh, real sink before it gets back on the repeated root parabola at the very end. Where you've just got one real eigenvalue that's repeated and one line of eigenvectors, one line of straight line solutions at the beginning and end. That's one thing. You can also go to linear phase portraits and take a more active role in how all this changes. You can change the parameters with the sliders. You can see the vector field up there. You can see the trace determinant plane here. You can see a plane, the complex plane, with the real axis as horizontal and the imaginary axis as vertical, showing the eigenvalues as you change the parameters. So 
So there's lots of neat things that you can see and try to help you understand what's going on if you do this. Finally, uh, I want to say a few things about um, all this material. Um, I've got a paper that I wrote for um, getting a promotion that I'd like to make available to you, and I will make available to you, that expounds on this in more detail. But I, I, I want to think a little bit about all that we're learning and, and how it relates to Christianity and, and your faith and how you live out your faith. Um, you can read more detail about this in the paper, but you might be wondering, you know, what's the relevance of all this? And, and can I really appreciate it and enjoy it beyond just the fact that maybe you do get enjoyment out of it, perhaps? Um, there is the enjoyment factor. You can appreciate math, pure math, just for its beauty and just for how neat it can be as a gift from God. And so I hope that's something that you cultivate. So that's one thing you can think of in terms of pure math. In terms of applied math, you might be wondering, do these imaginary numbers apply to the real world? Well, we are seeing that they do apply to real differential equations. And you can apply real differential equations to the real world, like harmonic oscillators. Um, I'd like to add to that kind of mundane application that there are lots of more sophisticated applications out there where real sophisticated math is necessary. Modeling the weather, for example, or modeling the airflow of uh, um, over an airplane wing. Those things get pretty complicated and take a lot of sophistication. Um, quantum mechanics is a topic that involves a lot of real sophisticated math, for example, and including imaginary numbers. And so those esoteric kinds of subjects really do have real applications. And, and I, ho I hope you realize that you can, you, know, you can live out your Christian faith using your mathematical and scientific knowledge by using what you know for good, for one thing, to uh, help bring good to the world and um, live out God's kingdom. And secondly, more specifically, I, there's a real need in the world for people who have a lot of broad knowledge about in-depth things, both broad and deep. A lot of university scientists are super, super specialized. They know really, certain things really, really well, but they don't necessarily know other things very well, as well, or at least as well as they, they might think they might. So what I'd like to encourage you to think about is to use your knowledge that you're getting here at Bethel and in the future, if you go to grad school, to not only specialize in something, which is important, but to also be a generalist, to have broad knowledge too, because what we need is we need people to communicate between specialists. We need people to be bridges to help specialists communicate between each other because that's when the real important breakthroughs occur is when people can share real specialized knowledge that's real sophisticated. And so I'd like to encourage you all to do that. That's the end of this video.